you have to become somebody. So I run an independent, uh, not-for-profit research think tank, and I study pyramids. It's something I love to do, and it's a, a fulfillment in many ways in my life's calling. So I'm on one end of life, you know, having found myself and in the full maturity of my life, I've raised two sons. They have nice families. Uh, you know, I live in a nice place. Um, I go to Egypt, I'll be going in a couple months. I lead tours, so I'm doing what I like to do and what I think I'm skilled and called to do. You, on the other hand, are a bundle of energy. You know, you're a bundle of energy that's not yet defined. You don't, you don't know what you're going to do yet. Some of you, maybe, very few of you may have very definite goals that you want to start marching out, but you'll, you'll probably find, because, you know, even counselors, school counselors today say you got to plan on three career changes. So one thing you need to do to be successful is gain as many useful skills as you, as you can. As you have opportunity to learn real things, learn them. Those are valuable. It's like somebody handing you gold. If somebody handed you gold, you'd probably take it. And another way to grab gold is to develop your skill sets. You are more valuable to an employer. And even if you're not working for an employer, you're more likely to build your own business so you employ yourself if you have the skills to do it. So you're going to see a variety of fields that can interact with Egyptology going to Egypt. And uh, so, I, you know, one of the things I had in mind is for you to think about, you know, what your place in the world is. All right. Okay, so there we go. So I'm jumping for joy uh, in front of the pyramids. As I told you, it's something I like to do. And uh, you've got to find your place in this world, as I just, as I just got through saying. Okay, so uh, let's go learn a little bit here. All right. Uh, the only writing in the Great Pyramid. Now, your teacher told me you guys have looked at hieroglyphs a little bit. Well, you know, one thing about the Great Pyramid and actually all the Fourth Dynasty Pyramids and most of the Fifth, there are no hieroglyphics in them. You know, we think of hieroglyphics being all over the place in Egypt, and they are in very many places, but they're not in the tombs, at least as far as pyramids or tombs, in the Fourth Dynasty, which is part of the Old Kingdom. The only writing in the Great Pyramid I'm about to show you is not hieroglyphics, at least it's not Egyptian hieroglyphics, okay? So um, that's it, those four letters. Those four letters are the only writing in the Great Pyramid. No gold, no silver, no jewel, no phonetics, no hieroglyphics, nothing except for a sarcophagus in the king's chamber and this writing, okay? So now, you know, one thing you need to think about in terms of who you are and finding your skill set, finding your calling in life, is looking at what you've been given. So my, my two families are, you know, the Pauls and the Dubars. That's my mom and dad's side, okay? So that's who I come from. Now, uh, about five generations back, Christian Paul was the Oberforestmeister. He was the keeper of the Kaiser's Forest in Germany. That's my great-great-great-grandfather. He kept the Kaiser's Forest in Germany. On my mom's side, James F. Dubar, her father, was the director of the New York State Ranger School for 40 years, the oldest school of forestry in the United States. He taught hundreds and even thousands of students to learn about trees and know all about forestry. And guess what? One of the many things I did in my past life was I ran a tree business for about five years. So I had it in my blood. Both sides of my family, you know, coming to me. And so, you know, why, why fight, why pet the cat against against the hair, you know, in the wrong direction. So, uh, you know, a skill set that I got. But uh, I want to focus on this name Dubar, the name that, you know, was from my mom's side, a name that I'm sort of in that inheritance. This is a picture of the front of the Great Pyramid, the, the, the entrance. And uh, the, those letters are at the very entrance of the Great Pyramid, okay? Those four letters that, that you saw there. And uh, so I'm circling Dubar there. Now, there, there is me with some uh, adventurers that I took to the Great Pyramid, and we are standing at the original entrance. So those chevrons that you saw in, in a drawing, this is what they look like. You can, you, you can sort of see them back there, the, those chevrons. That is where, behind where we're standing, is where those four letters are, the only writing in the Great Pyramid. Okay, so Robert Schock, who's a, a geologist and he's an expert on the age of the Sphinx, he wrote 
a, a piece about these four letters in the, in the journal Mysteries of Archaeology, okay? So uh, here is uh, from, from an ancient uh, Berber alphabet. So it's, a, it's an African, a Northern African, an old language. You can see I've got the D circled and that V. And so the D is a V. It, it looks like a V. So this V right there, uh, basically, you know, that one right there, that's a D, according to Robert Schock. And then this letter right here, which is like a circle with a line through it, is the B because here is uh, another ancient African language, and you can see the B is a circle with a line across it. So there's the there's the B, and then uh, now he, he, from that article that Dr. Shock wrote, he, he you can see it says possible interpretation of the letters. So he's got I've got it circled there. He's got D B R in capitals. He's saying that's that's the phonetics of these letters. And so he also says for the R symbol, the one at the end there, he says in Toreg, which is another African language, ancient language, R is a circle, but an optional symbol for the sound of R is a double vertical line. So the two symbols seem to be combined. So you can see that you've got a circle with two vertical lines. That's an R. Now in ancient languages, there are no vowels. So Dubar, if you take the U and the UA off, my family name, it's basically the same letters as over what on the Great Pyramid, okay? And then that, uh, Dr. Schock says, is a symbol for either E, a small E, like a vowel sound, maybe anciently there was some kind of vowel sound, and also the number three. Well, what could the number three mean? I know when the sun takes the first step, the father's yes. proud. If you make it to the water, he will part the cloud. I know he made you a snack. Okay, so uh, Chance the Rapper's sporting a three on his hat. So uh, three can be a symbol for all kinds of things. So anyways, I'm saying that my, you know, my sense of calling, my, my telling you that I am doing the work that was meant for me by studying the Great Pyramid, how much more do you think I felt that when I saw that my family name is carved into the very entrance of the Great Pyramid, Dubar, okay? So what does Dubar mean? Or take the, the vowels out, what does you know that word mean that's written at the Great Pyramid? There, again, there's a, a, a drawing of where it is. There's the letters. So just a quick word about uh, my, my grandfather, uh, there was an article written about him when he retired, all the people's lives he'd touched. So I took my sons out to a picture of him where he's honored at the New York State Ranger School. Where, and part of the Adirondack, if you ever go out to the Adirondacks and hike, part of the Andirac, Andirac, Adirondack Mountains are named after my grandfather, the James F. Dubar Memorial Forest. Okay, so, uh, you know, you know, back when men were men, you know, he, he taught people to... Uh, I uh, used to go up in the mountains with his dog Emma there, and uh, it's got his, you know, his gun with him. Uh, somebody said about him in his course, Elements of Forestry, that he taught more than forestry. He taught ethics, psychology, sociology, organizational behavior, professionalism. Uh, somebody said, there is so much that I owe to that gentle giant, I can never repay him except to behave like he did. So he led the faculty, he led the students. Somebody said, uh, you know, he, he, he talked about more than just the subject at hand. He taught morality, integrity, the work ethic, as though by the very force of his personality, you would remember, we did. Therein was his secret. We remembered the message he gave by the way he lived. Okay, and here's a picture of him at this reunion. And uh, he's right there at the center. And these are some of the people that he walked. So when I look at this, I think of a, wor a word. My, I remember his uh, wife, my grandmother, used to say, you know, he doesn't just say things. If he says something, he means it. His word is, is good. Okay, so I looked up uh, an ancient meaning of this word debar, and it says uh, to command, to declare, to name, to appoint, to tell. And so it's like a word. It's like a word, a word spoken. So this is what I'm looking at now, because this is my desk I'm presenting to you from. And uh, I look at this and I think of the word. And so the Great Pyramid on which those four letters is written 
speaks. That's one thing that those four letters say to me because that's what those four letters can be interpreted to mean. Okay, now I want to show you a quick interview. Uh, Charles Coase has got a YouTube channel. He interviewed me, and I, I want I just want to play a short clip from this because I want to hear you. I want to have you hear how he introduces me. Uh, hello, everyone. And today we are talking to Mr. Larry Powell, the director of the American Institute of Pyramid Research. He runs the website greatpyramid.org and greatpyramid.us. He is a brilliant researcher. In my okay, that's what I wanted you to hear. He said he is a brilliant researcher. So he's uh, got an independent channel. It's much bigger than my YouTube channel. So I was flattered by that. But uh, one of the stories I tell in that interview, which is, which is on YouTube, both his channel and my channel, the whole interview, I said, uh, here's a picture of me and you're an Egyptian chair. And I said, so much has happened my first day here. This was when I was there in October. You know, uh, Too much to tell, and it just turned noon. The Giza Plateau police made me delete all the photos and videos I took inside the Great Pyramid. So that's an interesting story I could tell maybe if somebody wants to ask about that, but that was the adventure I had that day. Okay, so thinking about talents you have or interests you have, are you interested in exploring? You know, so I'm basically an explorer. That's one of the things I do. And this, this is with a group of people I took inside the Great Pyramid. This was on the autumnal equinox in 2019. And we're looking at something we, that, that was found by a friend of mine, Robert Grant, that's basically an ancient letter like the Greek alpha, just like A is the beginning of our alf alphabet, the English alphabet. A uh, Aleph, or, uh, Aleph is the beginning of the Hebrew alphabet and uh, alpha is the beginning of the, of the Greek alphabet. So we we're looking at that, we we're exploring, okay? So here's what we saw. That's, that's, that's the alpha, the Greek letter A, but it's more ancient than the Greek language. Uh, that's on, that's on the rim of the sarcophagus in the Great Pyramid. Most people don't even know that. Hundreds and thousands of people go in there and they have no idea. So I guess there is a little bit more writing mm -hmm. than just those four letters at the front. There's this alpha and there's an omega after it also. So another thing you can do is teaching. You know, you can teach at the college level. You can teach, uh, you know, I taught world history at the high school level. I taught uh, political science at the college level. And so here I am teaching a group of people and this is right in the shadow of the Great Pyramid. So you can be a teacher. And I used to teach students just like you. They were just a little bit older. And I had a man named Sharif come to my class who came from Egypt. Uh, there had just been a revolution in Egypt called the Arab Spring. That was back in 2011. And the Egyptians had just overthrown a dictator they had had for 30 years, Hosni Mubarak. And so uh, here's Sharif talking to my class. You can see me in the background. It was the third speech for Mubarak. And everybody thought that it was the end. And he was going to say, I'm stepping down. Speeches speeches. So he's talking and to my class Thursday, about the revolution. It was the third speech for Mubarak, and everybody thought that. It okay, was but Sharif didn't just teach in my class. He also spoke other places. Look at this. This is Tahir Square, the center of downtown Cairo. Look at this. just see some, something of what was behind that 2011 revolution as my friend Sharif was speaking to the whole crowd there. 